My guest today is co-captain of the New South Wales Swifts netball team, a member of our mighty Australian Diamonds national netball team, and now children's author, Maddie Proud. Why is sport important to a country's development? What is it like being a role model for Australian children? Well, Maddie Proud joins me now to discuss these questions. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Just, you very much for having me. Well, that's great. Minor premiers, I hear. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, let's focus on premiers, but I'll take minor premiers for now. <laughs> now, so I, I was, we were just talking actually about this concept of minor premiers, isn't mm. it? Because it's, uh, it's, it's a very Australian sort of thing. We just like to celebrate anything. Yes, anything right. Anything and everything. <laughs> but what it really means is you've kind of won the league and now there's like a finals competition. Yes, but right? I think it's one of those things that you don't want to look back in six months' time and think, oh, well, at least we were minor premiers. <laughs> I think I'd rather be actual yeah. premiers. So yes. I think sometimes it can almost curse you. So I'm like... We can talk about it now, but as yeah. soon as finals actually start, we'll, we'll just focus on that. <laughs> look, I mean, I think given our uh, our rugby league team in in state to state competition is 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 under a bit of challenge. I think the Swifts uh, taking us to the to the Premiership sounds like a pretty yes. good thing. Well, we did win the State of Origin battle last week, so I think that's the main one that people are talking about is the Netball State of Origin, isn't it? I don't think the there's Netball nothing, State there's of Origin. No other State of Origin going no, on. No. <laughs> In fact, I mean, I'm not much of a rugby league guy. Actually, my boss, uh, Dale Connor, would kill me because he's a massive rugby <laughs> league guy. But I've often wondered why you need six tackles to score a try. Oh, well, I'm from Adelaide, so I grew up with AFL. Didn't <laughs> okay, even know AFL. there were two different types of yes. rugby. So well, I'm still, is, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely I'm uh, still new to all of this. I'm being from Hong Kong with this concept that a game where you hold a ball... <laughs> And, and bounce it is called football. It's, I don't, right. I, I never understand any of those. Net, netball doesn't really make much sense either no. because you can't even run with that ball either. But anyway, at least well, there's a net and there's a ball. But so there's it makes a net sense. and a ball that makes some sense, right? <laughs> Very true. It so it's, it's a real privilege to have you here. You are, I would say, our first Australian national representative on this podcast, Ooh. right? So you're carrying the weight of everyone <laughs> who's represented our country. It's I'm an honor. Sure. It's an honor. So, um, you know, lots to ask you. Um, but I guess the first thing is, so you're, you know, you're a professional player, uh, you know, you lead your team in a, in a co-captaincy, um, you play for our country. When did you realize this professional sport thing was a thing for you? I probably don't do what happened, really. I think that growing up, I was a huge sporty kid. I have two brothers. I'm the middle child of of two brothers, very active parents who kind of had me throwing a tennis ball before I could walk and <laughs> kind of grew yeah. up in the backyard. I think that, you know, uh, if anyone watches me play netball, they probably know that it started from a young age in terms of diving on anything. It was diving on the football, diving on the remote to win that. And just kind of that competitive nature was in me <laughs> from the moment I was born and um, was often, you know, at recess or lunch, just out playing with the boys. And I think that, you know, girls sport or women's sport was still kind of in its infancy when mm. I was growing up and you definitely had that bigger focus on men's sport and again with brothers anything I watched on TV was always men's sport and then it probably wasn't until I got really involved in netball and kind of my team started going and watching the professional um, team which in Adelaide was the Thunderbirds that I kind of realized that that was something that you know you could aspire towards but back then netball was still only you know not even semi-professional to the point where the players were working full-time and still had other jobs mm. and netball was still almost just like a hobby and even in my first year playing professionally, I think my first contract I signed was for seven and a half thousand dollars, which as a 16 year old though, was like way huge. better than working at the supermarket yeah. or doing what my friends were doing. Yeah. But um, yeah, I guess that kind of shows that the leaps and bounds that female sport has made in, in the last few years. But um, yeah, again, netball was just a sport that I loved so much. And amongst other sports that I played was probably the one that stood out to me the most. It's kind of that whole um, idea of being the ultimate team sport and that you can't get the ball down the court without your teammates. That just really sort of stood out to me as a young mm. kid and then just kind of progressed through the ranks, I guess, until one day I was standing on that professional stage. It's interesting you we, we were saying earlier about, you know, you, you were sporty and you could really have gone to any sport. Mm. Um, and it was netball that really got you rather than, mm. say, women's soccer or football. Or, or, um, or, or any other women's sport. Is it, was it the real team dynamic of netball that got you? Yeah, I think it was a mixture. Like I, you know, I haven't played cricket growing up. I was the only girl in mm. the year five cricket team. Soccer, football was one. I did a lot of tennis when I was younger, but I think it was sort of twofold. I think that netball was probably out of all the sports I played, the one that I was maybe the naturally better at and sort yeah. of had those, that kind you of skills. That natural yeah, gift felt kind of that there. connection there. But I guess growing up as well, netball, and this is probably where as female sport has evolved, netball has always kind of been that female dominated sport. And it's probably unique in that sense that yeah. it's the only sport 
really in the world that is dominated by women. And I guess, um, you know, when you were growing up, it was, you know, my brothers played football and so the girls would play netball. And it's kind of something that we've always been really proud of as a sport as well, though, is that we haven't kind of ridden on the coattails of men to become a professional oh, sport. And yeah. as much as I love the fact that, you know, you see AFLW coming out and cricket is becoming, you know, so much better for women and they're now getting amazing pay deals and, you know, getting all this exposure, I think that netball is so great in the fact that, yeah, it's built by women for women and it's something that we've really been I guess trailblazers in the female sports space and so I don't know if subconsciously as a five-year-old that was something that stood out to me <laughs> it's probably only with hindsight that I've thought of that but yeah, yeah I guess a lot of your You're friends are playing it. Five -year -old. <laughs> oh, <Jeez. well>, well. <laughs> <laughs> of course you met you met a budding five-year-old yes. earlier right so our, our producer's daughter was in here <laughs> and she was very like you know, very excited about meeting you and um, I mean, for the audience, I had to prevent the legions of fans from <laughs> uh, from the uh, Lend Lease fraternity that wanted to come up and meet you today. So um, that's pretty exciting. But you actually speak quite passionately about about young people and young girls wanting to play sport. Well, why is that? Why is that important to you? I think for me, like sport is what made me who I am. I think that I look back on, um, you know, particularly probably that those middle years of school when you're sort of developing and becoming a teenager. And I think that, you know, you hear a lot of stories of particularly young girls that can go down a variety of paths or I feel like a lot of your you know, formative years can be determined by, you know, the things that you're doing at those ages. And for me, sport was a saving grace. It's what made me who I am. It's what made me the friendships that I've got now. Mm. It's what I think, you know, sport teaches you so many skills like resilience, hard work, commitment, and there's just so much to it that you, again, as a 11, 12, 13 year old, you're probably not thinking about those skills that it's building, but, you know, it, it gets you away from probably other avenues that you could go down. And I just think that, you know, I look back on my school and I love school, like to the point where mm. I miss it now. And that's a lot of that is because of sport. And I think that, you know, young girls that don't get involved in sport and, and boys, they miss out on such a, a big part of their life, not only from, you know, just the joy of playing sport, but probably the skills that you learn as well. And I think there's some scary stats out there. I think, you know, don't quote me on this, but it's, it, you know, once girls that reach the age of 15, 50% stop playing sport and that's really just, especially in Australia and I think that was a lot of that was off the back of COVID for starters I think mm. that a lot of girls said that they weren't going to go back to sport after not having it um, and I just think that that's a really scary future that you're looking towards if a lot of young girls aren't playing sport it's not, it's not what you'd normally associate with our country right no. you know, when we think people think of Australia we think of ourselves as young and free and mm -hmm. it was in our national anthem we are, we're outdoorsy we we love sport mm. like we're sport obsessed right so to hear a statistic like that is sort of counterintuitive, isn't it? It's so, yeah, and it's, it's frightening as well. And I think that that's where maybe we need to be better in terms of obviously women's sport is, is growing and it's becoming so much better. But I think that, you know, when you think of sport, I think you're speaking of sport of Australians and there's probably still that male element to it. And mm. I think that, again, there's so many layers to it, but I think social media has been a big impact in that, you know, young girls now probably are more worried about what they look like or what they are perceived as being like on social media rather than when I was a teenager, you just going out and playing sport on the weekends and having fun with your friends. And yeah. there's probably just so many other things that are going on in, in young people's lives that, again, I don't, I don't know if that's the exact reason, but a lot more factors that probably deter them from playing sport. And it's just that participation level as well. It's not meaning that girls have to go out there and want to be a professional athlete, but it's just getting out there with your friends on a Saturday and and doing, you know, being active and, and being with, you know, a good group of people that I think is the most important part. And again, I think that's where if the more female role models we can have in sport and, you know, that idea of you can't be what you can't see. And if young girls aren't seeing the fact that they can become, you know, a professional athlete and do that for a job, then they're maybe not going to be inspired to do so. So I think that we're definitely taking the right steps, but there's still probably a long way we can go in that area. It, it's, it's interesting. So Erin Dowman, who you met earlier, who's, who's one of our colleagues here and, and plays netball, when you're coming in, she said to me, oh, have you heard this podcast with Natalie Portman, uh -huh. right? And uh, isn't she the actress? Yeah. Right? yeah. And so what she's done really interestingly, she, she came on, she started a, a women's soccer team mm -hmm. in, in the United mm -hmm. States. And when asked why, she said, well, women tend to love sport, like people, how many girls do we know that love mm. their rugby league team or their rugby union team, less so these days, or uh, or um, or football team? And why is that? And what is the reason that women can get involved in male sports? Mm. And why not women's sports? And she said the reason for that, in her mind, was that men's sport has had generations to develop, generations and generations to develop, and the teams have a, a, a history and a culture and why do young people get into sport? Because it's something their parents love mm. 
and they all get together and it's a ritual, it's a culture. Like I support mm -hmm. the Giants, the mm -hmm. New York Giants, right? You put in the jersey or I support in my case, you know, um, you know for us in Hong Kong, you know, we, we didn't really have uh, team sports, but we had a national team mm -hmm. and we were all viciously proud mm -hmm. of this national team, even though we didn't really win very much, right? Um, and so what she was saying was in order for that to happen in women's sports, you've got to continue continue to professionalize and invest mm -hmm. in the sport and you've got to get you've got to get this culture of people wanting to see mm -hmm. it and be part of it and she emphasized a lot of the points that you made which is the importance of sport is that is the fact that people can come together and mm -hmm. celebrate that goal or or you know or the score at quarter time or whatever it is and is that sort of sound right to you? Yeah, 100%. I think even that, that idea of history and legacy and wanting to play for that or wanting to, you know, be someone that goes every Saturday and it becomes, like you said, a family mm. ritual. I think that netball's still got ways to go. And I think that the Swifts in particular, though, um, the club that I play for, have a long legacy. And we've we celebrated 75 years of the club last year. And you've got people like Liz Ellis who played for the club who then went on, I'm yeah. a celebrity, we had it in one yeah. and this creed of the jungle. And I think just doing things like that and getting netball out there is what kind of does drive that. And, you know, we can only look as far as we had a team recently that came into the competition at the um, inception of Super Netball. So it's been Collingwood Football Club brought in a netball team and they were around for the seven years. And then we just found out a few months ago, a few weeks ago, actually, that they're no longer going to be a team. And I've read a lot of things about oh, players wow. that have, have played yeah. for them. And a teammate that I actually played for when I was at the Thunderbirds, she said that exactly what you've said about this history and that she said, people weren't coming to the games because they had no emotional connection to the team. And mm. while I think they originally thought when they brought in Collingwood Magpies, you know, you'd get the AFL supporters. Yeah. But if a team isn't successful straight away, you're not getting those diehard fans that are coming week in, week out. And she'd played for the Thunderbirds with me and Thunderbirds had gone through a couple of years of having some, you know, real bad you know, seasons we're not making finals but you still had those diehard fans that came for the Thunderbirds of 2010 that won and they just want to kind of push you through but Collingwood didn't have that and I yeah. think it's a really good point that you make that teams need to be able to create that culture and it, it's a fine line because you can't create it if it is, doesn't exist if that yeah. makes sense if you don't have a legacy to stand on then you can't kind of just create that out of thin air so I think that that's just an example in female sport but I think that the more that we can get people to come to games and netball is probably one of the sports that you know we have such a high participation rate and that I think we're Huge. the highest participating All, sport in the world any in girl the you speak to I you know I've been playing netball and you know I played netball at school 100%. I played netball at school and then Fewer and fewer women then say, I play netball socially, mm -hmm. right? So our producer, Erin, she, she plays netball. Mm. Um, you know, actually both Erins, right, Erin? <laughs> um, both Erins are playing netball, right? So, um, so but it, it's becoming, yeah. I mean, mind you, as, adult, as adults, I mean, you get less opportunity to play Ooh. team sports, I suppose, but. And I think as well, yeah. it's that transfer of like getting people that play the sport to then come to games. Like yeah. we have like a million people or something in the country play netball, yet we're, you know, Swifts are getting the highest sellout crowds, which is 10,000. Mm. But in the scheme of things, you get a game of AFL that gets nearly 100,000. And it's like, yeah. why aren't we seeing that transfer? And I think it's exactly what you said. It's making professional athletes that are netballers be household names and be, um, you know, something that people want to go and see because they've created yeah. this, you know, dynasty or legacy. And I think, again, progress is being made, but I think that's the real kind of gap that we need to sort of I close. Th I think commercially what has been interesting to watch is, you know, if you look at the AFL as Sydney Siders, I mean, AFL, we had one team, right? Mm -hmm. We had the Swans. Um, when I first moved here, it was it. And of course they were an import from Melbourne. Mm -hmm. right? You know, um, one of my great friends, uh, Glenn, Glenn Campbell supports the Swans. He's a Melbourneian mm -hmm. through and through, uh, but he supported them when they were a Melbourne it's team. Melbourne, yeah. And there's still a bar in Melbourne mm -hmm. that he goes to <laughs> to watch this, and they've got you know yeah. the Swans, and he he sent me photographs of it. So that team had a history, and now mm -hmm. has its history in Sydney. And I think what has been very interesting is that you know you saw Arabella earlier with her QBE Swans netball shirt, mm -hmm. uh, and the import of the creation of Greater Western Sydney or Western Sydney Giants. Mm -hmm and it's netball team, one of the things I've, I've noticed is that the, the way to create this legacy in history is to get them while they're young, mm. right? So some great friends of mine, uh, members out at, at Western Sydney Giants, the dads, and what, what he was saying to me, Chris Hall, what he was saying to me was, they take their children, one goes to AFL, the other goes to netball, mm. maybe they both go to AFL, um, but the dads are all wearing Giants gear mm. when they go, right? So they've got the Giants hat on and it's the same Giants logo for the netball team. Yeah. 
as it is for the AFL team. And that means you support the Giants. Mm. It's not the AFL team or the netball team, it's mm. the Giants. So I wonder whether that model is actually creating that legacy for yeah. both men and women's sports. 100%. And it's, it's one of those ones that it's, it's so hard because I, I totally agree. I thought when Giants Netball came in, it was great because they had that affiliation. And then we've got the Sunshine Coast Lightning mm. who came in that are affiliated with the Melbourne Storm. And then obviously we've had Collingwood, but they've probably not had mm. the same success. And it's it's that real sort of twofold. And I feel like I have the, the dilemma all the time of being like, yeah, is, is the answer to getting netball, you know, on people's screens more to sort of marry up with a AFL team or an NRL team? Mm. But then you're also like, as I said earlier, the best thing about netball is that we've been able to stand on our own two feet and not have to kind of yeah. come off the back of men's sport. And, you know, again, you see the success of, of the AFLW and, and essentially that's coming off the back of the AFL. And my partner plays cricket and he, um, you know, often talks about the fact that the female cricket has been able to do so well, but they have a revenue share model where they essentially share the money that is made from the men's sport as well. And so, oh, again, right. it, okay. it's it's great and it's it's so, um, you know, exciting to see the progress that those sports are being made, but it would just be amazing in my eyes to be able to see netball take that step without having to rely on, on anything else. But I don't know if that's possible, which is the the bad thing. But I think that, yeah, it, it would be awesome to kind of be able to tell that story. And, you know, there's obviously the, the story now of should men's netball become a bigger thing because we're essentially missing out on 50% of the population mm. by, you know, not celebrating men's netball as much and it is getting bigger. But how cool would that be to see that the female sport is now actually lifting up the male sport in, yeah. in netball? But, again, that's probably a, a little ways down I, the track. Know, <laughs> it's, it's funny you say this. When I was at school, we, we played mixed netball, mm. right? And we used to love it. It was fantastic. You know, everyone got together and we had a great time. I mean, I, I jest often that um, I didn't realize girls were so vicious on court, right? <laughs> yes. there's, there's a couple of elbows put out there, you know. Honestly, and, uh, and, and what blah, blah. Aaron was saying, there's just quite a lot of verbal abuse yeah. on court, right? And like, I might have got a caution on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think... Is there a place for that kind of thing? Do you think there's a mixed netball league? Well, there's already like there are um, like mixed competitions and there's you know male competition. Like we even on the weekend we had like I said we said played with the Queensland team, so mm. it's sort of the state of origin, and they had the men's team play before us. Um, and then you know they have like uni games and they have mixed netball, and um, I think it's it's definitely growing. And you know netball has this real aspiration of being part of the 2032 Olympics. In, oh wow, that's yeah. kind of this big sort that's of Brisbane. project. Yeah, Brisbane. Ah. So yeah. But the Brisbane issue, yeah. the issue is that to be able to kind of submit a sport, and you know how the host country gets to mm. essentially nominate, you need to be able to provide for men and women. So they're now uh. saying that if netball is going to come into the Olympics, we need to be able to support the male side as well. So again, mixed could be the answer as well. Or there's also a fast five um, version of of the sport mm. that um, is sort of like the T20 of of netball for for the cricket equivalent. But um, yeah, I think that the more we sort of explore those different opportunities, because again, there's your netball purists that say, oh, netball should only be for women and blah, blah, blah. But then it's also like we're literally dismissing 50% of our population by not providing, you know, men and boys the yeah. opportunity to play. And, and men and boys can play, but not, you know, it's the classic... Men, I think boys, once they get to a certain age, have to stop have playing to stop at grassroots playing. and then they have to have their own competition. So there's sort of so many areas that you could explore to kind of grow the sport in a whole different sort of range of ways. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because you don't often hear that presented in that way from a, a women's perspective, mm. leaving out half of the population. <laughs> it's normally the other way exactly. around, right? It's normally it's the, so true. you know, it's we've, got to, we've got to bring, sure. we've got to bring women into it because yeah. men have, you know, it's, but, uh, it's fascinating yeah, to Yeah, that's where I think netball is so that. unique in that sense, which is quite fun. I mean, look, one of the things I, I, I will say is that the, the growth of women's sport, mm. um, I, I have two young daughters, one is the same age as Arabella, um, uh, and, uh, and um, actually, no, she's not. She's double her age now. I, 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 still, I still think of her as a five-year-old. She's not. So, um, but one, well, the interesting, the older one um, is, is playing netball and football, mm -hmm. soccer, and uh, has um, on her wall, she's got, you know, you guys, she's got mm -hmm. the, you know, the Australian diamonds, she's got the Australian football team. Um, and it, it made me reflect on when, when I was growing up, the, the girls I hung around with would support teams that, you know, had men in them. Mm -hmm. And those were the players, they would have a, a Roger Federer mm -hmm. or, or somebody like that, right? And then they would, but they would have female tennis players because female tennis has been mm. so strong and you know serena williams and and you know before her martina hingis mm. or anyone like that you know but it didn't until i heard 
uh, until I heard it described, it sort of struck me that now, if, if wh where would you have gone to for women's team sport? Well, exactly. Even me growing up, like I was loved netball, but again, because I had two brothers, my Saturdays were spent going to the football and then, you know, being Adelaide with massive Crows fans, we'd spend the whole day going having a barbecue before the game. And, and I loved it and I never thought anything of it. No. But I guess that's where, in as many words, it's sort of the parents' responsibility as well to... But that's the ritual, isn't it? Right? it, it exactly. Yeah. That's where, you know, I think netball is trying to create that. And even at the Swifts, when you talk to the kind of game day people that run our events, mm. and it's like, we want to make it an experience where you come to the netball and then you want to make it something that... Even even your sons want to come to and even your husband wants to come to and, um, yeah. you know, it's something that, yeah, maybe one week the family goes to the netball and the next week you go, you do go to the football and you sort of cater for everything. But, yeah, I think that even, you know, I loved netball more than anybody and I still didn't even really go to the netball and that's yeah. probably the gap that we are trying to, mm. to close. And, again, it's getting better, but there's probably yeah, still always ways to move forward. And, and it is that sort of the competition for time mm. is so strong now that you you to go to a game, you've got to make it yeah. easy to do, 100%. right? So one of the things, you know, we, you know, here we talk about cities, right? Mm. Um, and we talk about culture of the city and mm. what makes a city work. And one of the things we struggle with in Sydney is the ability to get to games yeah. and what you do when you get there. So, um, you know, a good example is Homebush, which mm. is going to be redeveloped at some point. There's going to be a new metro station, um, all that. That was our Olympic precinct. Mm. It's still difficult to get to. When you get there, there's nothing to do there. Yeah. I mean, you can get you know you can get a drink from a food truck or something. <laughs> you go to the game, and then it's a nightmare to get out of it, and there's nothing to do after it. And despite all the effort in trying to make it work, it sort of hasn't happened. Whereas you go to a game in Melbourne. Yeah. I'll take a contemporary Australian example. Mm. Um, it's it's a breeze getting in there. It's a party atmosphere mm -hmm. getting in there. When you get out of there, there's immediately things to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you're a family with young children. What what um, example would you rather have? Would you exactly. have the sort of, let's get out to Homebush and really fight to get there mm -hmm. and, you know, and uh, Prime Minister Modi was there recently. 26,000 people turned yeah. up to see him. So obviously people go there. But, um, <laughs> exactly. you know, but, no. but um, you know, for a, for a family of four, you know, let's go out and see the netball. How the hell do I get out there? Oh, gosh, you know, do I, I've got things Parking's to do. Parking's a nightmare in Olympic uh, Park. Yeah, there's, so yeah. we've got to get better at, 100%. At, at this sort of thing. And, it, and sort of um, sport and culture really makes a city thrive, mm. right? That That's really the element of place. And I think one of the things we, you know, we actually built Parramatta Stadium. Mm. So um, we, we sort of have done a lot of thinking around mm. this. And we're, now, we're looking at the Moore Park precinct now and all that. And, that has a, a better chance of success because it's sort of in an urban yes. environment, you know, and there's lots to do around there. And so, and certainly in the, in Sydney's West now, with such strong population mm. growth, that there's two great opportunities. One is to start seeding in young people, many of whom come from migrant populations. Mm. Two out of three new migrants to Sydney are living in the West, yeah. right? So seeding sport with mm. them is an important part of, of cultural understanding, For right, sure. with each other. Um, and, the second opportunity is to create a new part of of Sydney that doesn't repeat the mistakes of the past yes. in terms of disaggregation and difficulty 100%. to get to. So, yeah, anyway, that's a, that's a side issue, but, uh, <laughs> but it is very much related. No, I 100% right? agree. And yeah. it's like you said, even for us getting to a game, like we play out at Homebush and you know, some days you've got to allow 45 minutes, we've got the DFO traffic as well coming in on a weekend. Deal. So we don't want to get, we don't want to get the way of those Coming guys. from little old Adelaide, everything's <laughs> 10 minutes, so it's been a little bit of a culture shock. I, I love Adelaide. Though. No, I, do, do, I do, love, do, I, do. I mean, um, we, you know, we, we have a, a pretty strong presence there and we build lots of stuff mm. there, but um, Adelaide Oval is yeah, one of the things we've played with. Yeah. I think that's one of the best sporting facilities. Um, in the but I confess that we like going there because of the wine and cheese. Yeah, oh, that's well, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the Barossa, you got the Plow and, Bow, you got the Hills. Of course, there's a bit of sport there. Too. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, but so it's, um, can we go back uh, to what you were saying about team? Because I thought that was really interesting. So we had recently we had Graham Arnold come and mm. speak to us about being a, you know, being a leader. And uh, our CEO um, Tony Lombardo is a massive sport guy, right? Mm. Particularly AFL, he's obsessed. Um, he supports the Kangaroos. Oh. Yeah, North Melbourne. Bad luck. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Sorry, Tony. Um, but um, but what's interesting about what Graham Arnold was saying about team building was sort of, um, you know, he, he talked about courage and he talked about mateship. These are sort of things you, 
you accept, right? But he also talked about the the pressure of social media interfering with a team. Mm. You lead your team. Mm. Interesting, you lead it as a co-captaincy. Mm. So I'm I'm quite interested in that. What does being a leader mean to you? How do you cope with that? And what does it mean? Well, I guess two questions. What does it mean first being a co-captain with another person? Mm. Um, how does that work for you? And then what does it mean to you to lead a team? Mm. Well, so when I came to, I moved to the Sydney in for the 2017 season. So I'd played about five years in Adelaide. Um, I'd been captain of our under 21 Australian team. So I sort of had a few leadership roles kind of before moving to Sydney and I feel like when you're younger, you get leadership roles because you talk a lot or you're sort of a bit <laughs> out there and you're confident and you can kind of feel like you can say things and, yeah. and do all of that. So, you know, you sort of get them for that reason. And I also feel like when you're young, you kind of, it's the classic, if you're one of the better players in the team, they make you a captain because you sort of lead by example when you're on the court. Mm. And so I'd been part of our leadership group in, in Adelaide before I moved to Sydney. And then I came to Sydney, I think I must be about 22. And so I came into a new team and all really exciting. And then in my second year at the team, got put into like the leadership group. So it was part of that, a captain, a vice captain, and I was sort of the, the third extra and then in 2019 so only my second sort of started my third season um our captain left and then it was sort of this whole idea of who's going to become the captain after that and we had this really young team we'd sort of come in in 2017 as this new influx um when they brought in a new competition and had a lot of girls from interstate or overseas come in and then it sort of got to this point of well who's going to take on that role and um our coach ended up just putting it to a vote of who in the team um wanted who they, who they wanted, sorry, to be the captain. Oh, so and, team selected. Yeah, team selected it. So it, and I guess because there was there probably wasn't a real obvious choice because, again, we were all quite young. There probably wasn't someone that had been that vice captain for a long time, and so it was a natural progression. So I ended up getting voted just as sole captain in that 2019 season, and for me that was a bit of a shock. I kind of didn't expect, especially only my third season at a new club and still only being relatively young, and I remember sort of having this moment of being like, God, what am I? What am I going to do? Like, what sort of captain am I going to be? All these wow. sort of questions, and then. But, but just let, let's look at that for a moment, because your colleagues, your teammates, mm. said, "We want you to lead us." I mean, that that must have felt. I mean, I, I can imagine it was daunting. But you must have felt, wow, that's oh, that's uh, that's a sense of recognition. A hundred percent. I think that's what gave me that confidence early on was that you know if the coach had chosen you, you'd sort of have that always that doubt of like, did the team actually want this? And so for me, it was sort of that ideal situation, and that I loved the fact that it was voted by my peers. And then I think early on, I remember I can't even remember who the person was, but they gave me the advice of when I was questioning what sort of leader I was going to be. They said, well, your teammates voted for you for the way you are now, not because of mm. you know who they thought you were going to be or this you know alter ego. That they thought you were going to take on and while obviously there were a lot of areas I needed to grow in and there were skills I needed to develop it was sort of that idea of just being true to who you are at your core and that's the reason that you are in that role and I found that really comforting and sort of thinking all right I don't need to go and you know I'm someone that likes to have a laugh and likes to be people's friend and I'm not that real you know dictatorship yeah. of a leader and so I didn't need to become that person and yes I needed to be that person that had tough conversations when they were needed and I needed to be able to you know um, lead by example when I was on the court and and you know be that leader off the court as well but you know at my you know truest self I just needed to stay who I was and that 2019 season was actually you know it was the year that we sort of turned things around we'd gone from being this really young and inexperienced team and we ended up winning a lot of the games early and we sort of had this real role essentially and everything just clicked and um so as a leader, it was kind of easy because when you're winning, being a leader is easier. <laughs> um, you know, right. I always joke about the fact that my job was only flipping a coin and calling heads or tails. Oh, and, dear. Um, then it came to round seven and we'd guaranteed a finals berth. I hadn't played finals in sort of all my years and then I ended up doing my ACL. So I, oh, um, for those listening ouch. that don't know what an ACL it means, I had to have a knee reconstruction and was out of the game essentially for 12 months. And that for me was this real like oh, like, how do I now be a leader when I'm actually not on the court? Because that's sort of how I'd prided myself, the way mm. that I'd played. I, you know, threw myself at everything, always gave 100%. And while I was developing those leadership skills from an off-court perspective, that was definitely where I needed the most growth. And, you know, it's that kind of cliche of everything happens for a reason. And I truly believe that that injury kind of made me become a better leader because for starters, it made me get me through my injury better because I knew, you know, straight away, even after it happened, I was like, all right, I'm out for the season, going to be 12 months recovery, but I've got a job to do because I'm the captain of this team and mm. I need to get us into the finals and I need to get us to win a grand final. So it gave me that distraction away from, you know, my rehab and kind of feeling sorry for myself. But then on the flip side, it was like, all right, well, how do I now become a leader by actually not doing what I would usually do on the court? And we had this real, you know, 
I guess, altering moment when we all kind of stood in a circle and were really vulnerable with each other. And we sort of just talked about things that we found difficult or things that, you know, it could have been netball related or not netball related. But for me, I sort of shared with the group the fact that I'd always had this sort of fear of not being liked. And as a captain, it was this really scary thought to be like, if I'm the person that's having to tell you doing something wrong, but I'm also meant to be the captain and I want you to be my friend, how do I kind of get past that and the art of the difficult conversation 100 percent. and we now sort of just call them genuine conversations because they shouldn't be hard if they're trying to help yeah. people and and yeah. i think that for me just being you know open with the team by saying if i'm telling you something that you're doing wrong it's not comfortable for me and it's something that i really don't like doing but the fact that i'm doing it means that it's for the betterment of the team sort of the moment that i got that out it was as if this weight had been lifted off my shoulders and and now anytime i had that conversation with a teammate they were like well you know what maddie doesn't want to be having this conversation but she's doing it because she thinks it's the right thing it sort of changed everything. And, and again, I think then being able to be that leader and sit on the bench every week and be able to still give from the sidelines rather than giving from on the court, um, that probably yeah shaped the type of leader that I then became. And I still think I'm growing, but I think every year I've been able to take those steps in, in you know, pulling a few different skills from different areas. Um, and then in the co-captaincy, I think that now it means that you kind of have that I'm not saying that leadership's a burden, but sometimes it is. And sometimes it's a job that people don't want to have. And by having a co-captain, it means that you can feed off one another. We have very different skill sets. You know, I probably, am, we joke about I'm the talker and she's the doer, um, <laughs> which I think is an insult to me. But um, we, we sort of say that, you know, she's maybe quieter in I'm other sure areas. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but she also, you know, on game day, she might be the person that revs the team up, whereas I'm yeah. the person that then on the court does has a different role. And away from the court, I might be the one that speaks up in team meetings, but then she's the one that's sort of looking from afar and then inputs when when she needs mm. to and and we've sort of found this really good um you know way of working because it means that you know not everything is put on your shoulders you can talk about it together and then you can tackle it together and um yeah i don't think co-captains is for everyone but in our situation especially being you know when we when we did become co-captains that we were still quite young and mm. it sort of helped us be able to grow as leaders together fascinating because it, it, it's interesting because you see a lot more co-captaincy roles mm. in sport mm. and increasingly you're starting to see them in corporate mm. leadership roles so several corporates have had co-managing directors mm. or co-executive directors or co um and it's I, I think where some of that started was exactly as you as you put it well actually you know a leader can a leader always have all mm. the skills needed to do this particular mm. thing what if you supplemented that person with another set of capabilities mm. and maybe that the, if they gel well, you get 10 times the okay. result, right? So I agree with you. I, I don't think co-leadership is for everybody, mm. but it can work and it has worked corporate in corporate settings for very, sure. very well. Um, and I think that lesson has actually been drawn from, from sport. sport. And I think as well, yeah. like, I remember my first year of being captain, it was like, I took everything on my shoulders, like to the point where a player would say to me, I'm tired today. And I'll be like, oh my God, is that my responsibility to go and tell the coach that maybe we shouldn't train as hard today? And maybe we should have some time off. And like, to the point where it was like, <laughs> wearing me down because I was like, oh my, like, and it was, it was all on your shoulders. Exactly. And it was like, I remember even having a conversation with that coach and she's like, Maddie, sometimes I think that the things that you're asking me, if you just took a second to actually think about what you're asking me, you'd realize <laughs> that it's nonsense and you don't need to be. And so it was then almost that idea of, okay, well now I've got a co-captain. I can talk to her about it. Yeah. We can decide amongst each other. No, this is just dumb. We'll just go back to the player and say, yep, you're tired get a few extra hours sleep tomorrow night. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's a very poor Come example. On, yeah. Exactly. But I think it was like, oh, I would be standing there being like, well, I'm the captain, so I have to do everything. Yeah. But the art of delegation is great <laughs> as well. And getting other people yes. to sort of share responsibilities and empowering others. I think that's a huge part of leadership is giving other people oh, the power to, yeah. it's the smallest job in the world. I have a girl that I, you know, she's a younger player and she now is responsible for telling us what colour singlet we've got to wear every week. But it might sound like the smallest thing, but it means that on a Sunday night, I don't have to worry about what's that colour singlet. Right? And she's great yeah. at it. She's then, it means that she's now grown as a leader in other areas as well. And it's, yeah, the tiniest things can make a, a real big impact. But again, going back to that, conversation about young people in sport those those lessons mm. those experiences are where you learn them 100%. as a young person like I, I i hazard a guess that you were probably captain of your school team at yeah, some point yeah, right was, there yeah. you go right? <laughs> so, so i think going back to your earlier point about you know involvement in team sports early mm. on uh, I, I think is so important and interesting i was talking to my daughter about this actually because she you know one of the challenges we have as as two working parents is getting kids to Mm -hmm. to the right things on time yeah right it is a it is a growing challenge and one of the things she does is she plays the trumpet she's mm. in a band 
and I think that's great. Music's yeah. wonderful. And they had their first sort of big performance together. And, uh, and I went to see it. And it was a band camp. It was out in the middle of nowhere in Goulston. Anyway, oh, there we were. And I saw her with her team, her band, right? And they were, you know, they played. And I saw her talking to her trumpet colleagues and then talking to her broader colleagues and looking after each other mm -hmm. and saying, come on, guys, we can do this. And I'm like... I never imagined that no. was the case in a band. Band, exactly. You know, I never thought a trumpet player would have a sort of leadership role exactly. in a trumpet setting, right? It sounds ridiculous even and saying And so you might it, not right? even but, realize it. And that's the thing I think that's well, the best thing about sport or yeah. bands or being part of a team is that it's something that comes naturally because you yeah. love what you're doing and you want to get yeah. the best out of everyone. And that's why I think that, yeah, exactly what you said, those skills that you learn through that are often subconscious. They're not even a conscious it's, thing it's you're right. doing. Yeah. And it can, yeah. So that totally the importance just, of that involvement in team activities sure. early on is, is critical. I, mean, I, I want to go back a little bit to, oh, before I go to that, actually, just on the coach. So you've described being a leader, I guess, a, a first amongst equals, really, is a sort of mm. team um, arrangement. What's coach do? It's a good question. <laughs> no, I think that we actually, like, I, I find that I've obviously experienced a lot of different coaches um, throughout my career, and I think that our coach at the moment, Brian Yehu, is the ultimate, it's, it's hard to explain in terms of like, so we, like I said earlier, we have a lot of players that have come from a lot of different places. And so we've often been referred to as a family. And I think mm. sport is a family, but we to the point where I spent, you know, the last seven years up until this year living with teammates. So I live with three other teammates. Oh, really? We then had a house of international players with three of them down the road. So seven out of our 10 players in the team lived together in two separate houses. And so it was this idea of, you know, we didn't have family in this state. So mm. we became each other's family. And Bryony, our coach, has four sons. And so she's got a big family. And so she really just instilled that idea of, of being each other's family. And I think that's where I, I talk it's about probably that. Probably what drew it to netball when you have four sons. Like, exactly. You know. <laughs> I was going to say she needed to get away. That's she needs right. to get some female energy. <laughs> but um, that idea of being vulnerable came from her. And she was the one that got us to sit in this room mm. and really be open with each other and develop these like true, genuine relationships. And, you know, it's funny. You, we had a player come in this year um, from another team and she played this other team her whole career. And when you're from another team and you're looking at the other team, I think they always thought, oh, Swifts are fake. The Swifts just act like they're this family and everyone's like, there's no way they can possibly be that close. Like it yeah, must just right. be a facade that they try and create to, you know, intimidate other teams by being with this close. And then she said after her first few weeks there, she's like, wow, like you guys truly are that close. And I think that, um, you yeah, know, that can have inverse effect as well mm. when you're too comfortable and too close. But I think that that's where yeah. Bryony, you know, I think that the sign of a good coach is when they can have that real transition between being your friend, but then being your coach. And I think that Bryony balances that perfectly and not many coaches can do that. I think some coaches worry too much about not getting close to you and being your friend because they need to be your coach. And mm. then others, you know, want to be your best friend. And so then you kind of can't find that line between, well, when do you then step into that? coaching role and I think that she's just been able to find that perfect balance and that's what gets the best out of her players is that she you know we know that everything she's doing is for us and for us to be better and so that means that if she's absolutely roasting me and yelling at me on the sidelines she's doing that because she knows that I can be better and um you know at the end of the game you can then still have a laugh and still be you know she's someone that I think that for the rest of my life I'll be a part of her mm. life if that makes sense and I think that's pretty rare to get in in professional sport and um again yeah I think that's come from this family that she's built but then also just demanding excellence and always wanting you to be better and um yeah so the coach I guess she's the person that brings that team together and I think she also sometimes just lets us be, which is probably her best part as but well. That's the that's that's the test, isn't it? Mm. That, because the um, our, our chief executive also talks about being a coach. Mm. Like he wants to, mind you, for a coach, he loves interfering on the field uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of the time. But that said, <laughs> and, and I say that in jest, of course. Uh, um, but but he does talk about this importance of, as a chief executive, the importance of being a coach, letting mm. your executive team make the decisions they need to deliver the objectives that, that he has set and the board has set for us as a company. Um, and the executive team, then that's empowerment. Mm. But even if it's a small thing, like picking the color yeah. of, the, of, of the vests, right? You can empower your, your team, right? Um, even, even our little podcast is a good example, right? Like it started as just, you know, me with a tape recorder and we have a production team now. They mm. all have Rose. responsibilities at mm. all, at all comes together right sure. um, and that empowerment factor is is critical i think in sport and in business um, Absolutely. but there is that test how do you 
how do you be a successful coach and let your team succeed? I think it's an interesting example. I think some World Cups ago, uh, South Korea did amazingly well. Mm. People like South Korea, how did they yeah. get to the, I think, I think they even hit the semifinals mm. from memory. And one of the reasons why they did is they played as a playing group together mm -hmm. all the time. They didn't have international megastars flying no, in to, so to play. Yeah. And the coach basically made them live like a family. Mm. And that's why they played so well together because they knew each other so exactly. well. And the coach had this sort of relationship with them that empowered them to perform for their country. Like I thought it was a really interesting really interesting example and when you know each other you know like you know i know if a teammate now goes into a dark place if they've missed a few goals or they've yeah. you know thrown a few passes away the girls know the look i get on my face if i'm sort of not feeling like i'm in flow or whatever and that's the thing the more in tune you are with each other the more little things that make you know, sort of, you, know you talk about sport one percenters it's the little one percenters that add up to being the difference and i think as well what you said about a coach it's like i think they're not on the caught with you when mm. you're playing in the heat of the battle and you know your, your boss in in business isn't necessarily in that meeting with you when you have to make those decisions and so i think it's yeah it's huge for them to empower you because they can't be there every step of the way and they can't actually step out on the court and play with you um so while they got to do what they can during the week and you know throughout training and put structures in place um yeah we have to be the ones that make the decisions in in the heat of the moment while you're there right i mean there have been of course in throughout history there have been player managers in, mm. in various sports and I used to be a Coventry Football Club supporter when I was a kid. And Terry Butcher was a player who then and became coach. a manager and then yeah. came back and then it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Let's go back to this social media discussion because I think that was that was something that you know has been a lot of the coaches that came to speak to us recently um, have talked about, like the impact of social media mm. on on players. And I uh, players, I, I I I will broaden that by saying on people, right? Mm. So you know, it seems to me, particularly for young women, being father of young daughters, is it worries me about the amount of content that is constantly mm. flying at you. You've got to be, you know, and, and no one, no one publishes uh, on Instagram a, a photograph of them, you know, yeah. you know, doing something that mm -hmm. isn't wonderful. Like, you know, normally you're on a beautiful holiday mm -hmm. or you're riding, you know, some kind of sailboat or yeah. horse or something, doing something amazing, <laughs> right? So everyone's doing something amazing. And then you have this other sort of negative bit of social media, particularly those who are in public life or in sporting mm. life where, you know, hey, Maddie, you were terrible today. You know, yeah. what on earth were you thinking, you muppet? <laughs> you, know, you know, that type of thing. How do you deal with that as a captain? How do you deal with that personally? Mm. Well, I think like the first part of your question, I think, yeah, it's it's such a hard world to live in in terms of like that art of comparison now as well. Mm. It's always, well, so-and-so's, you know, living this life and she's living this life. I'm like, I could have gone to Europe last year, but then my friend's in Europe now. So now I'm jealous, but she yeah. was jealous of me last year. And it's like, exactly there was what you no said. Facebook when I was growing No up, one's right? posting what they aren't having fun doing. No. So it's not an accurate representation yeah. of life. But I think I'm at more... work at the moment. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, I know, right? I know. And so I think it's just yeah. once you step back and realise that, yeah, people are only posting things because they're, mm either enjoying it or doing something glamorous, then yeah. you can get past that. But I had a conversation with someone once who was talking about, you know, female athletes being um, role models on social media. And it's the fact that, you know, young girls often the photos they're seeing are of models or of people like yeah. that. And I think athletes, well, you know, you to try and pick the better photos of yourself. When you're playing sport, <laughs> you're not, yeah. you know, making the nicest faces. You, you know, you've got muscles that you're working in the gym for. And I think that's where athletes can be great role models in that space because, it is a bit, you know, more real when it but is. But do girls like to see like athletes, you know, muscular? Yeah, I, I mean, think I, that, think, so, I right? think there is being a gradual change, yeah. and I think this idea of you know being petite or you know mm. is 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 changing. And I think the more that you know people can appreciate, you know, that your body is there to be able to help you do a certain thing. Yeah. And um, you know, you see a lot of netballers, and even the body type from netballers from when I started to now is changing so much. We're spending a lot more time in the gym. We're spending a lot more time on speed and explosiveness, and and that's what makes an athlete great is is that side of it. And I think that that is becoming a shift in that um but you've also got to choose to accept that shift yeah. if that if that makes sense but, but there's a societal i guess recognition of um of of body and shape 100 and, and, and i like think that's that, been right? a, a lifelong you know thing for a lot of people but i think the more that it's in your face in social media is harder and i think that's where you've <sighs> It, this kind of ties into your next question is like you've got to choose what you're exposed to and mm. we talk about that in terms of like if i know if i've had a bad game i'm not getting on twitter i'm not going yeah. on twitter straight after because i just know what's going to be on there and you know sometimes you can't 
you know, escape what's being said. It's like the TV shows where you try not to see the score of a sports show, but you put your blinkers on, you, you do. But anyway, I think it's like, yeah, I, I'm smart with, you know, if I want to talk to myself, I'll go on Twitter and, you know, yeah. do that. And, um, you know, our coach often again is like, I don't want you grabbing, you know, we have to put our phones away during the game and then you get them afterwards. And she's like, we don't need to be looking at them straight away. You guys need to do your recovery. We'll sing our team song. We'll do this. And then you can get on your phones. Like yeah. it's like the first thing we don't need to be doing is checking our stats or checking social media or checking what people have mm. said about us. So I do think it's like you can protect yourself if you try to do it. And, you know, again, you'll be exposed to certain things whether you like it or not, but it is often a choice who you follow, who you're going to, you know, engage with on social media. And, you know, the idea of trolls and things like that. I'm like, no one happy is ever writing a bad comment. Mm. I'm like this... I have Joe Blow that's telling me that I had a shit game, yeah. bad game. Is it's okay. Is, it's is, PG. Um, <laughs> it's a is, family show, <laughs> man. He is not a happy person because no yeah. happy people are writing those comments. No, and so, exactly. I worry about these things mm. because I, interesting, Graham Arnold, one of the things he said is he tells his players no social media. Yeah. Just no, no, right? Forget about it because mm. what's the point, mm. right? Um, are you really missing out no. on, on anything? Um, if you're not on social media, and and I think a lot of people are saying that. And in fact, you know, I've been so sort of, as I as my daughters grow up, wondering when they're going to start asking for their own phones. Yeah. And, and I mean, they have they have like, they have access to iPads and things like that mm. where they watch TV, but they're not asking awesome. for social media. Yeah. They're not asking for yeah. Facebook or Instagram or any of this sort of stuff. Um, and one of the one of the you know, increasing bodies of, of evidence is that the longer you delay that process, the better it is for yeah. them because, you know, children's brains are developing and what you expose to them you know, will influence the way that they're mm. developing. And I think being a child is complicated enough, <laughs> Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, being an adult is complicated exactly. enough, right? So, I mean, you know, so I just think this is an area where as a society, I think sport's leading the way again because... Sure. For all the things, all the reasons you said, which is, you know, if you're going to perform at your best, you don't need all this outside no, no, sort of information no. that's sort of coming to you. You want to focus on the task at hand exactly. and setting the objectives at hand. And against there are, there are parallels, right? For, for for those of us in business, you know, when we don't do well, we're told, right? Um, there's plenty of exactly plenty of feedback <laughs> to us. Uh, and uh, and the mm. same goes for, for others. Um, uh, quick question on your book, yeah. Grace on the Court. Yes. Tell us about that. <laughs> So I, it probably is in line with what we've been talking about a lot in that I wrote the books for a few reasons. Firstly, when I was growing up, I loved reading, loved sport. And there was a series called Specky McGee, which is about a young boy playing AFL oh. and sort of was written by an ex-AFL footballer along with an author and was sort of just about that progression of trying to make it to the AFL. And my mum's a journalist, so I sort of had oh, really? loved writing yeah. as, I, as I grew up and would always sort of be writing stories. And then I sort of got to this age where I was like, well, where is the market for books about young girls playing sport. And, you know, there were a few here and there, but I never sort of was able to find one that was, you know, for that age group and about netball. And I sort of chose the age group of starting high school because I think that, sort of as I touched on earlier, that transition from primary school to high school and becoming a teenager is such a critical part and a critical time in a young person's life, particularly a young girl. And I think that, you know, you can develop a lot of, you know, your um, traits and your sort of, I guess, passions at that age that then ultimately determine where your life leads. And for me, that was where sport came in. And um, I've always kind of had this idea that, you know, through writing these books, I sort of have two goals. I either, you know, have a young girl that's never played sport before, but loves reading. And she picks up my book and thinks, all right, now I want to play netball. She's 13, right, the yes, character? So yes. she's just beginning high beginning school. Beginning high yeah. school. Or on the flip side, a girl that loves playing sport, but doesn't really like reading, but she's like, all right, now I'll read a book about netball. And I think that, you know, reading, writing is a part of everyday life. And I think that the more that kids are reading and not on yeah, social media yeah. or playing sport and not on social media, you know, the, the better their lives are. So I sort of wrote it because it was fun and I loved writing. And then, you know, once I sort of thought that it could become something, I was like, all right, well, now I can actually, you know, influence, I guess, what young girls are That's doing fantastic. with their time. And um, yeah, it's been a real sort of passion of mine. And I get those messages every now and then from mum saying, you know, my daughter's never read a book, but she read yours cover to cover in one night or, you know, my daughter doesn't like sport and now she wants to play netball. So how um, good must that feel? Though? Oh, that must just, I get one yeah. of those messages and I'm like, I'm done. I've, I've, I've hit my goal. <laughs> and I'm like, if I can get a few more, then yeah, I'll be very happy. So um, yeah, little, little bits that you can Another do. Another book in the in there the is. Office. So there's Grace on the court, there's Grace back on court, and then it alludes to a third. So now that she's I'm, back on court, what happens well, next? Well, that, that's a good question. If you know, you can <laughs> let me know because I'm, 
<laughs> I'm suffering a little bit of writer's block at the moment. I've sort of got too many ideas and sort of too many paths that she can go down that I just need to commit to one yeah. and then it will be all right. So I'm sort of, that's my plan in the next couple of weeks once our, you know, after, after we win a grand final, hopefully, I'm going to get back Grace into writing mode. Captain. Maybe. There you go. We'll see. I've just added yeah, I'll, to I'll, uh, I'll give you a little note at the start of the dedication <laughs> well, just hey, for your idea. We're up for it. We're up for it. That's great. Look, we'll have to end soon. I mean, we could go on forever. It's been fascinating. But we're in a great place, I think, you know, with, with women's sport. There were three things you wanted to keep the momentum going. What would they be? I think the number one is just media exposure. I think, again, it's on the way forward, but I would love to see, you know, Netball on the front page of the paper, on the back page of the paper, when there's another male sport on at the same time. I think mm. Netball gets, you know, Netball or women's sport gets a good go when there's maybe not the competition, but I would love there to be that sort of equal. Yeah. Like the origin media would, like, the 100%, origin would get. A hundred percent. Um, I love just young girls to keep playing sport. I love that stat that I talked about earlier to go the inverse mm. in that, you know, young girls are playing sport more than ever. Because um, I think at the end of the day, there's the most choice for girls now. And I think that that's why people often think it's like a competition now between women's sport, like, oh, netball's competing against AFLW and cricket. Mm. And to a degree, they are at the business level. But from like a participation level, I'm like, how great that a young girl, you know, Arabella growing up right now has a choice as to whether she wants to become a professional cricketer, a professional netball, yeah. a professional, you know, AFLW player. And so... Given I her think, mother, I think she's playing netball. Yes, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Aaron. Good choice. Good choice. Um, but yeah, just providing that choice and having it at the grassroots level. Um, and number three, oh, I mean, you hate to talk about money, but you'd love to get, yeah, you know, that that pay increase and, and sort of getting recognised. You know, netball is still only a, a semi-professional sport mm. and, you know, we still have a lot of girls that are, are having to work and, and do other things. And I think that for us to get the best out of the sport and to become, you know, the type of athletes that we, we know we can be, becoming fully professional is, is the way to do that. We're going to win the World Cup? Yes. Maddie Proud, <laughs> thank you so much for being part of Smart no, Thank you for having me. <laughs>